So I rang the bell to open the meeting because we uh, need to keep an eye on the time schedule today. And uh, I would like to welcome the team Motor Bay. And uh, we're very much looking forward to your presentation. The uh, projection of the ECB's April monetary policy decision. It's, of course, uh, very exciting because it's the exact day that also the Governing Council uh, will uh, discuss this. But first, it's your turn to tell us what, uh, what your analysis and assessment is. So, please go ahead. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michiel Milanovic. We are Team Motor Bay from St. Catherine's British School, Athens, Greece. First, we would like to thank you for the opportunity to come here today and share our projection of the ECB's April monetary policy decision with you. So, firstly, our presentation is structured as follows. We will give you a projection of the ECB's April monetary policy decision. We will then discuss the key influential factors that have led to our decision. We will then do an economic analysis and a monetary analysis, followed by a cross-check. And then we will further suggest any complementary policy for Eurozone countries. So to start off, our monetary policy decision is that the standard monetary policy will remain unchanged with the MRO, the main refinancing operations interest rate, at 0.05% as it was initiated in September 2014. As for the um, non-standard monetary policy, we predict that the expanded asset purchase program will be carried out until end September 2016, amounting to 60 billion euro monthly, and that the credit easing package also go on with the uh, long-term ref long refinancing operations initiated in September 2014. So throughout our presentation, we use a series of flow charts. And the white boxes, they represent current events. And the blue boxes, they are, are our, our outlook, so our predictions. Moving on to the key factors. These are the key influential factors that have led to our decision. Firstly, the accommodative monetary policy of the ECB. The components of the uh, accommodative monetary policy are the credit easing package, these are the long-term refinancing operations, which is the ECB giving loans with 24-month maturities to banks, with, which is paid in six-month intervals compared to the regular uh, one-week maturity loans. Secondly, the asset purchase program, which is the mass purchase of euro area sovereign bonds. And thirdly, the low MRO interest rate at 0.05%. Moving on to the effects of the APP, we have the mass purchase of euro area sovereign bonds has led to the euro, the price of the bonds increasing, which in turn has lowered the yield for the bonds. And this has had two effects. It's created a search for the yield, but has also created a, an upside risk on economic sentiment. So the consumer confidence and the producer confidence are increasing. And we can see that from the graph, we can see that the consumer confidence has been increasing which is the blue line on the graph, which is over here. And the uh, industrial confidence together with the services confidence has also been increasing. And moving on to the search for the yield, so investors are now looking for more profitable investments. So because the, the yields are going lower on the bonds, they are turning to the stock market. And they are investing their money into stocks rather than the bonds. And we can see that the value of equity has been rising because of this. And we can see on this graph of the major euro, euro area stock markets, we can see that they have all been drastically increasing since the announcement of the extended asset purchase program in January 2015. And we can see that the euro stocks graph, which is the, the blue line, has drastically been increasing together with the, with the DAX and also the IBEX, which is the Spain stock market. Now, this has led to an increase in private sector wealth, as well as, and therefore, private consumption has been increasing. But private consumption has also been affected by the consumer confidence. So together, these two, these two effects have an overall, um, overall, overall upside risk on output growth. Moving on to the effects of the credit easing package and the low MRO interest rates, we can see that these together have lowered the bank's refinancing costs, which has had two main effects on the loans to non-financial corporations and the loans to households. And we can see from the graph that there's been a decelerating decline of loans to the non-financial corporations because of the lowered bank financing costs. And we can see that uh, the, this is the blue line, the green, the green blue line at the bottom, which is the loans to NFCs, the non-financial corporations, 
has been has been um, has had a decelerating decline. So it's moving close to zero, but we predict that in the future it could even grow positive. So it'll show a positive growth. As as for the uh, loans to households, we can see that they have been steadily increasing, and overall these two have had have um, they have resulted in a increase in the broad money supply, which is the M3, as we can see from the red line up there. Um, the red line, which is increased by 4%. Now we'll move on to the euro exchange rate movement. I will pass on to George. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I will be talking to you about uh, the euro exchange rate movement. So what are the causes and effects of the euro exchange rate movement? Uh, we have asynchronous economic cycles between Euros, the eurozone and the major economies. Uh, that is, uh, the US is uh, having steady growth, uh, whereas the eurozone is having slower growth. Um, we have diverging monetary policy of the major central banks. Uh, the U.S. is now exiting uh, its quantitative easing program. Uh, the Eurozone, uh, the ECB just initiated its expanded asset purchase program. Uh, we also have uh, diverging uh, Eurozone uh, and global sovereign bond yields. Uh, uh, US, bonds, uh, US bond yields have remained the same, whereas Euro area bonds have uh, decreased uh, with a few, co few countries also uh, um, being into uh, negative uh, yields. These three factors have led to uh, the depreciation of the euro against major, car major currencies, uh, which has increased uh, net export growth. Moving on to explain how net export growth has, uh, ha has increased, uh, we have boosted export competitiveness as a result of the weakening euro, uh, which uh, in the future um, we predict that will also bring weaker purchasing power. Uh, these combined uh, will, bring, will uh, widen the trade surplus because we have increased exports uh, but uh, decreased imports. This in turn will bring net export growth um, and will increase aggregate demand since um, net export growth is a component of aggregate demand. Uh, and this is currently bringing an upside risk to output growth. This can be seen from the figures right here. In quarter four, the trade balance growth was 8% eight, uh, eight, uh, year on year. Um, Whereas in uh, Q4 2014, we have a year-on-year -year increase of 77%, a massive increase in uh, the figures of trade balance from quarter uh, two to quarter four of 2014. We have a net export growth from minus 0.6 to 0.2 uh, in quarter four of 2014. And we also have a small increase in output growth, 0.1% uh, year-on-year. Uh, also, the bilateral exchange rate has went from 137 uh, in quarter two 2014 to uh, 1.074 in quarter one 2015. Uh, so we can see a huge decrease in the bilateral exchange rate. I will now pass on to Alex so he can explain the oil price movement. Thank you. The next key influential factor that we will be talking about is the uh, oil price movement that has been going on for the past 10 months or so. Now, first we have to look at the causes of the oil price movement. What is causing this decline in oil prices? Well, there is a supply and a demand side to this. On the supply side, there has been a positive supply shock, accelerating the supply of oil globally due to the um, accelerating U.S. shale oil and gas production since uh, 2013. On the demand side, there have been decelerating emerging economies, namely um, emerging economies have decreased their growth rates from double figures to single figures, for example, China. And this has led to a global deceleration in the demand for oil. Now, these two combined have led to a, de a decrease in the, oil, in the prices of oil. Now, the decrease in the price of oil ha has had two effects. First of all, it has lowered the cost of production globally and within the Eurozone, as well as uh, Im uh, decreasing the prices of imported goods within the Eurozone. Now, to further look at uh, the lower prices for imported goods in the Eurozone, we uh, must first understand how drastic this change in the uh, oil dec uh, price decrease has been. By looking at the percentage change in the Brent price of oil, we can see that it has halved from June 2014, which was its peak price. Now, this has led to uh, lower energy costs in the global economy and thus lower headline inflation in the global economy. What effects this has on the Eurozone is that import prices in the Eurozone have gone down, the imported, uh, prices of imported energy and the prices of imported foods. So what is happening is that the Eurozone is importing deflation from the global economy and this has uh, reduced uh, headline inflation within the Eurozone, as can be seen from the graph here, where you can see um, the OECD CPI, both headline and core, as well as the Eurozone HICP, both headline and core. And you can see that the uh, headline uh, inflations of both the OECD and the Eurozone have decreased greatly due to the decrease in energy prices. Um, as well, this graph um, uh, also highlights the um, 
decreasing import prices which have a huge weight on the eurozone hicp and these decreasing import prices are as i said the decreasing imported energy and the decreasing imported food now uh, as the two graphs are nearly symmetrical the other effect of the oil price decline are the lower cost of production in the eurozone now what has happened is that as energy costs have decreased due to the decrease in the price of oil um, the cost of production have decreased now the table here shows the oil index gas price indicator of Northwest Europe, which shows that energy costs have decreased. We have two indicators, um, one being the euro per megawatt hour, the other being dollars per MMBTU, which can be, um, in a sense, compared to a barrel of oil, but for natural gas. And you can see that both of these have been decreasing and are expected to decrease for April, May and June of 2015, um, due to time lags involved in the contracts that uh, are signed for the back pricing of the gas. Um, this in turn has decreased cost of production as can be seen by the producer price index for the Eurozone um, which has decreased since Ju June 2014 and this um, is expected to boost aggregate supply. Now combined with what George explained to be a stronger export competitiveness and a boosted aggregate demand we believe that uh, this poses a future upside risk to output growth. Now I will pass on to George, uh, to Ari. Hello, I will be talking to you about uh, the impact of stressed countries on the Eurozone and on today's decision. So let us first look at the causes and effects of stress in the Eurozone. Due to the fiscal consolidation undertaken um, in specific countries uh, for them to meet the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, there has been a severe recession uh, over the past few years, especially since the financial crisis. And so uh, in these countries there has been political instability as a result and also as a result, we can see high unemployment. These two factors had, have had an impact on uh, inflation or will have an impact on inflation in the future. Firstly, looking at uh, political instability together with the low interest rate environment, which we can see from the uh, negative deposit facility interest rate, um, which is minus 0 0.1, it was minus 0 0.1, now is minus 0 0.2%. Um, there has been uh, a higher demand for cash, an increase in the demand for cash. Uh, together with the uncertain political conditions shown by the spread of the Greek and the German 10-year bond since June 2014, which has actually doubled. Uh, these two factors have led to an increase, as I said before, in demand for cash and also an increase as a result in the uh, demand or as a result an increase in the growth of overnight deposits uh, from 5.4% to 9.3% and also a decrease in the short-term deposits shown by the indicator of M2 minus M1 gone from minus 1.8% to minus 3.3%. So in general, this has led to a high proportion of liquid assets in the M3. So the M1 over M3 ratio has increased from 55.79% to 58.41%. I will explain later how um, this will have an impact, may have an impact in the future. Moving on to the impact of high unemployment and recession. Um, due to the excess labour supply, which has lowered uh, wages, and due to the uh, recession, which has uh, forced mar market participants to uh, lead to price adjustments. Um, as a result, there has been a, a decrease in the core inflation in the stressed countries, which has been passed on to the rest of the Eurozone. This can be seen from this graph, where the black line is specifically the euro area unit labor cost growth. Um, unit labor cost growth actually includes both wages and uh, salaries, and this has gone from 4% to 1.4%. This can also be seen uh, in the case of core inflation. Together with uh, the stressed countries, the black line, the eurozone core inflation has gone uh, to a 0.7% level. So now we'll be passing on to George. So to summarize, to summarize our economic analysis, um, we uh, have two opposing trends. Uh, on the left, we have the asset purchase program, which uh, has led to accelerated private consumption, <coughs> as well as accelerated private investment. Uh, this uh, has in turn accelerated aggregate demand, uh, combined with the accelerated net exports uh, as a result of uh, the, lower the lower exchange rate uh, of the euro uh, compared to other major currencies. Uh, this, uh, in turn, has, uh, we predict that in, in an outlook, uh, the upside, the, there will be an upside risk to price stability as a result of the increase in aggregate demand. Also, there is a current upside risk to output growth as a result of uh, the increase in aggregate demand. And on the right side, we have uh, the downward pressures, which are uh, the decreasing oil prices, uh, as well as high unemployment. Uh, 
uh, lower oil prices have led to lower cost of production, uh, as Alex said, as well as lower energy prices. Uh, these have in turn, uh, and will, I'm sorry, um, the cost of production will in turn uh, increase aggregate supply uh, in the future, uh, as well as energy prices will contribute to lower headline inflation, as Alex explained previously, uh, and high unemployment is going to lead to co uh, lower core inflation, which will contribute uh, to lower headline inflation, and uh, also in turn um, to uh, a current downside risk on price stability. We believe that the left side will prevail, and that uh, it uh, to the right side, and uh, that is why we decide to uh, keep. Uh, uh, we have projected that the MRO will remain the same. I will now pass on to Aristides to uh, summarize our monetary analysis. So we believe. So we believe, in general, that there is a subtle risk, as I will explain later. But firstly, let us look at uh, what Michael explained before uh, with regard to the credit easing package and the low MRO interest rate. As a result of the, the two above, there has been a, an increase in the credit growth, putting an uh, upward pressure and acceleration of uh, the broad money aggregate, namely M3, and which actually poses an, an upside risk to price stability because of the increase in the money supply. Now, coming back to the um, political instability and the low interest rate environment, which has led to a higher demand for cash, as a result of the high proportion of liquid assets, there has been a lower proportion of illiquid assets. And so we believe in the future this will uh, mean that there will be less money available for credit uh, for banks to have uh, available for, for them to lend, leading to a deceleration in the credit growth, a deceleration in the broad money aggregate, and posing a downside risk possibly to price stability. We believe that the left-hand side will prevail, as uh, will um, my friend uh, Vardis explain now. By cross-checking the economic and monetary analysis, we can confirm that if the accommodative monetary policy continues, it should bring inflation rates towards levels of below but close to 2% in the medium term. However, we propose that European countries adopt uh, certain complementary policies uh, for the accommodative monetary policy. This includes both fiscal policies and uh, supply uh, uh, st structural reforms. Uh, in the case of fiscal policy, we can see that the stressed countries should ensure debt sustainability while in accordance with the Stability and Growth Pact. This means that government budget deficit should remain below 3%. While countries with an available budgetary scope, which means that they have a balanced or perhaps a surplus in their bu uh, budget, are recommended to accommodate easy monetary policy with a growth-friendly fiscal policy. In addition, structural reforms uh, can be seen through the labour market reforms, which will restore export competitiveness in stressed countries uh, through reducing job security and perhaps reducing unemployment benefit eligibility, and through product market reforms, which will create a competitive environment in these stressed countries uh, and uh, pr through privatizations and deregulation. And we can see that this will, in the long term, perhaps promote growth. So on behalf of Team Motor Bay, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, this has been our projection for a uh, the decision today, and um, we're now open to any questions you may pose. Thank you.